Hello, this is your instructor, Ann Parker, and I have condensed this slideshow down to about 200 slides from its original content, uh, which is on, on the website, and I've added some narration. So there's about 50 slides that have an icon on the bottom right corner. That speaker icon is what you'll want to hit to hear the narration and get more detailed information about certain images. On the other slides, you want to just read the text and notice any detail that you might be seeing in the design. And uh, we'll get started. So you might have noticed on the previous slide that this area, area is called the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, it was so named by the Greeks who had, a settlement, had settlements here along the shoreline of the Mediterranean um, and named after the Iberos River. And uh, again, it's an area of ancient habitation. So if you might recall the caves of Altamira in Spain, where we see modern Paleolithic cave art. Um, and again, the Iberians settled here about 4000 BC, followed by the, the Celts. Around 1100 BC, Phoenicians set up trading colonies um, along the coastline of the Mediterranean. The Romans ruled here for six centuries until the fall of the Western Roman Empire. And the Visigoths, a Germanic people, migrated here from Central Europe and settled. So it's, again, been an ancient uh, area of human habitation. And we'll talk about how some of these next cultures, the Muslims, for example, greatly influenced the design that you'll be seeing in this show. When we look at the satellite view of the Iberian Peninsula, you can see that it's surrounded by water, the Mediterranean on the right side and the Atlantic on the left, and very close to North Africa with that very narrow Straits of Gibraltar down at the bottom left of the slide. And so uh, there's also the Pyrenees Mountains that divide it from France, and much of Spain is very mountainous, as a matter of fact, and the soil can be very rocky and it's a dry hot country so this produced types of buildings that were primarily in stone uh, this was the main building material that they had and this mountainous terrain also created a slower exchange of ideas and more separation between communities also um, because of the sandstone that they have the red sandstone that was another thing that we'll see used in the different uh, buildings coming up. They also had limestone and granite, and marble was found in many areas. Also, ample deposits of clay to make ceramics. Um, so again, we'll also see the Roman rem remains that um, were left from the time of the Roman Empire in the next couple of slides coming up. But once again, this was not an easy environment to thrive, but many cultures did thrive here. The Romans made good use of these ample stone supplies with construction of things like the great aqueduct of Segovia. Uh, we've talked about this before, so I won't get into it here, but there are many remnants of Roman uh, occupation that are still left and that Roman barrel vaulted arch um, will continue to be a factor in the designs that we're going to be seeing. During this time, we'll see the influence of the Moors, which um, are Muslims coming in from Northwest Africa. And we will see them bringing um, different characteristics from Moorish buildings, such as the horseshoe arch, the pointed arch, uh, multi-foil arches, and different kinds of um, motifs we saw in Islamic designs, such as Merkwana's, of course, the mirab, the minbar, the mosque will be built, and we'll see the ablak arches. And this was, um, you know, very ornamental on the interior, where the exteriors are going to be a little bit more blank and unadorned, the interiors will be rich with uh, surface ornamentation. Another 
interesting thing about this area is that two of the world's great religions, Islam and Christianity, dominated the scene for centuries. And much of it, the design we're going to see is going to, need to be a reflection of those two thought forms coming together. Um, Christianity was very dominant in, Spain, in the north part of Spain and Islam in the southern part of Spain. And again, this uh, we'll see these kinds of mix in the architecture. Um, and this is why we call it Hispano-Moorish design. So the Moors were, again, Muslims coming in from the north of Africa. In 711, Muslims from North Africa launched an invasion across the Straits of Gibraltar, which you might have noticed on the map is that narrow passageway of water between the Mediterranean Sea and the, and the Atlantic, um, connecting North Africa close, in close proximity to the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, they came across those Straits of Gibraltar, conquering much of the peninsula within a few years, and then set up rule there for more than seven centuries until Catholic forces started the Reconquista. So in 1085, King Alfonso of Aragorn captured Toledo and began to reconquer um, or recapture Spain for Christian rule. And uh, they succeeded in 1492 when the last more stronghold of Granada fell. Um, but prior to that, it, this area had been a, a land of great religious tolerance um, that the different faiths were commingling and respecting each other's faiths. And as a matter of fact, a lot of people of the Jewish faith were key advisors and um, people that really helped the Moorish leaders uh, in some of their um, administration of, of the different kingdoms that they had established. A lasting legacy of design in Spain is when Islamic people from North Africa crossed the Straits of Gibraltar and overwhelmed the weak uh, Christian feudal states of Iberia in 711 AD. And they maintained different amounts of control through 1492, which we'll see uh, on the next slide. In, that also, in the meantime, there were also um, key Catholic kings of Spain um, that we will also see having great influence in the area. And um, this mix of elements between the Moorish, the uh, people of the Jewish faith, and the Christian faith will all factor into these very beautifully decorative designs that we'll be seeing coming up. When viewing this slide as in full screen mode, uh, you can see the green area or the, is the territory that was held by the Moors uh, in 1790, and then you can see how they slowly were pushed to the south uh, by 1492. Abdal Rahman was Umayyad prince whose family dynasty was overthrown in Syria in 750, and he and his brother fled and took a perilous journey across North Africa. And at one point, uh, the pursuers were hot on their heels the brother was halfway across the river and the pursuer said, we'll show you mercy if you come back. The brother went back and he was slain on the banks of the river. So this uh, spurred Abd al-Rahman to again flee even faster. Um, but he, once he arrived in North Africa, he was able to start amassing followers and he moved his followers to the Cordoba in the Iberian Peninsula where he established a capital. and if you look at the next few slides, you can see that he was responsible for having the great mosque of Cordoba constructed and very much inspired by his Damascus roots. So on the next slide, you'll see the great mosque of Damascus. If you recall the fourth holiest site in Islam with its Byzantine style facade. And this style of design will be influencing the design of the great mosque of Cordoba seen next. So this slide of the Great Mosque of Cordoba shows one of the oldest structures from the time of Moorish rule. And it's the site of many other ancient structure, structures such as an ancient Roman temple. There was a Visigothic church here in 572. 
There was a previous mosque of the Umayyads um, from 661. And when Abd al-Rahman arrived, he had a very large mosque built, uh, which was 590 feet long by 420 feet wide. And this was meant to share a message that Abd al-Rahman was here to stay to his enemies in Syria and in the Christian community. Uh, he wanted to show that there was a Muslim population large enough to support this large mosque. And he also had a chance to keep an eye on his followers because he would give the sermon and uh, be able to see who's falling in line with his leadership. So what you're seeing here inside the Great Mosque of Cordoba is the mirab or prayer niche, which is that horseshoe arch shaped structure. And again, that would be the wall that faces toward Mecca. Notice the gold tessera and the beautiful Islamic calligraphy with the vegetable motifs or the vegetal motifs. And note also the gold tessera, which is in the Byzantine style. So if you'll recall the face of the Great Mosque of Damascus, you see very similar treatment in the design uh, motifs. Also notice the dome with its crisscrossing rib vaults, which anticipate Gothic rib vaulting, and um, these pointed arches again coming in from the Middle East. And uh, we'll see more of this type of style coming up in our next slides. After the Reconquista, there was a Christian cathedral built from the mosque in 520 which is very gothic on the outside, but you're also seeing this bell tower, which was originally the minaret for the mosque, which was calling people to prayer. So uh, the mosque was very low to the ground, which was a sign to humble yourself towards Allah. Um, and then of course the Gothic cathedral reached up toward the heavens. So we'll see some mixture of the Gothic and Moorish style coming up on the interior. What you're seeing here is called a hippostyle hall, which is a hall full of columns. And this was the prayer hall for the mosque. And notice what we call the stilted arches. So we have this column and then this extra vertical protrusion going up to that banded, uh, beautifully banded red brick and limestone arch. And so this um, hall, again, is one of the icons for the Great Mosque of Cordoba. But if you look to the next slide, you'll see the interesting mix of the Gothic fan vaulting with the Islamic design. So this was when they added the uh, Christian church later under the direction of King Charles V, uh, who directed the mosque be converted into a Catholic Gothic style church. And this mix of these two very disparate styles is indicative of Hispano-Moorish design. And this is what we're going to be seeing uh, throughout the area where different time periods, different cultures, styles get kind of mashed together and juxtaposed off one another in these very interesting and unique ways, which is one of the reasons I think Spanish design is quite exciting and interesting because we do have these sort of time travel um, view in one Eiffel uh, where you're seeing the past and the cultures of the past mixed with things, you know, moving forward. So again, we'll see these uh, different cultures influencing each other and different design motifs influencing each other in very unique ways. Now we come to one of my favorite designs from Spain, which is the Alhambra. And it's a palace and a fortress in Granada in southern Spain. Uh, there had been a fortress on the site since 889, uh, but the form that you see here was constructed between 1309 and 1354, and it was the court of the Islamic Nasri dynasty. And it's one of the most significant and well-known Islamic pieces of architecture from Spain. Uh, it's called the pearl set in emeralds, which you can see with the white um, walls of the structures that are off against that green hilltop. So this is built as a series of quadrangles, uh, buildings around central courtyards with fountains. And you might recall that that is called a paradise garden in Islamic design. So the theme of the building is paradise on earth. And the name Alhambra actually means red woman, which you can see, or red female, uh, because of the color of the red clay, which the structure was made, or the red plaster work. 
And so you're, what you're seeing here is what's called a burqa or a pool, uh, which again is showing the might of the leaders that are able to bring water to this area. And, but this also functions to help cool the palace. So it's a symbol of power. And it's also, of course, a way that brings that coolness to the structure and also that sense of tranquility. One of the most famous areas within the Alhambra is the Court of the Lions or the Patio of the Lions, which is 116 feet long by 66 feet wide with 124 of these slender columns made from white marble. And it's also a paradise garden. So you can see the large alabaster bull supported by the 12 lions, each marking a different hour of the day. And notice the four channels or the four rivers coming from that central spring or fountain. Um, so it's meant to look like a, an oasis in the desert. And you can see the beautiful plaster work on the stilted uh, arches. And we'll talk more about that, what's called Yesoria on a subsequent slide. But again, this is an example of a paradise garden called the Court of the Lions. Okay, what you're seeing here is a detail which highlights some of the key decorative arts in Islamic Hispano-Moorish design. So the first detail starting at the top of the slide, again, is called Yesoria. Y-E-S-E-R-I-A, which is carved decorative plaster. So what they would do is take wet plaster and put stencils on it and then carve away the layers to create these beautiful details, very intricate details as you can see, uh, with the foiled arches, those lobes that are meant to represent leaves. And again, the plaster work itself um, doing different arabesques or interwoven geometric natural patterns. Then if you look beyond that, you see uh, the what's called azulejos or painted tin glaze ceramic tiles, and also some examples of zelij, which is a different mosaic tile technique. So we'll talk about all of these in a little bit more detail coming up. What you're seeing on this slide and the, the next subsequent ones is a beautiful art form called Zilij, and it's still practiced quite extensively in Morocco, uh, but it's basically tile work that's cut into certain pieces. As you can see, the tile is first fired and you can see those bright green, ochre, and blue pieces, and then chiseled and cut into certain shapes and then set into a plaster base using what's called strap work motif. So notice those flattened bands of pattern around the tiles. That would be called the strap work piece of it. And this art form flourished um, during the time of Al-Andalus in Spain from 711 to 1492. And it's still, again, very popular art form practiced in Morocco. And um, unfortunately, it's starting to become a bit less uh, available because it's very labor intensive. So you'll see a link to a video, a YouTube video where you can see people constructing these pieces of zelij and uh, just see how labor intense it actually is. And so some of the younger artisans aren't stepping up to uh, learn the craft. So hopefully we'll still have zelij in the coming century. This is a famous part of the Alhambra, which is called the Hall of the Ambassadors, which is 37 feet in length and 75 feet high. And the, the Merquanas that you were seeing, the, the domes the, with the eight pointed star is part of the, the ceiling of the Hall of the Ambassadors. But it was a grand reception room and throne room. And it's a historic location because this is where Ferdinand and Isabella gave Christopher Columbus his orders to sail across the Atlantic to try to find trade routes to India. Of course, we know he discovered islands in the Caribbean, not India, but this changed world history in a huge way. 
The other significant thing about this structure is you can get a good look here at the yesoria and notice that they also tint the plaster in different colors often. So you can see these beautiful shades of soft terracotta, green and blue, um, and that's all part of that carved plaster work or yesoria. And now we're moving to Toledo, Spain, which on the subsequent map uh, is, you can see just south of Madrid in the center of the country. And it's an area that of, with more than 2000 years of history from a Roman uh, capital to the capital of the Visigothic kingdom, a fortress of, of the Emirates of Cordoba, and then a Christian kingdom and also the temporary seat of power under Charles V in the 16th century. So we'll be looking at um, the artwork and architecture, which are the product of three of the major world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, coming up. When you look at this facade of the mosque, uh, you can see the various type of arches that were used uh, from different cultures of the area. So if you're starting on the bottom right corner, you notice the horseshoe arch, which you hopefully noted on the slide of the Visigothic church from the 500s. <clears throat> then it's all, above those, we see the Roman barrel vaulted arch, um, and we know what that is from our other lessons. Straight above that, you see three lobes or what's called a trefoil arch from uh, the Middle East. And then you also see that banded arch from the Middle East, those details. And then on the left hand side on the upper part, again, you see the multifoil arch. And again, this facade shows that mixture of all the different cultures and how uh, they're reflected in the built environment. One of the significant buildings in Toledo, Spain is this particular synagogue, Synagoga del Transito. And this was founded by Samuel Nalivai Ablufia, a treasurer to Peter of Castile. And he, his family had been um, in service to the Castilian kings for many generations. And he was given permission to build this very grand synagogue after the anti-Jewish riots of 1348. And the arrival of the Black Death or the plague in Toledo uh, fell on, severely onto people of Jewish faith who were blamed for bringing the plague into the city. Um, this is also known because the interior of the building features the Nazrid style that we saw at the uh, Alhambra with the beautifully decorative Yesoria or stucco work. So we'll pause here and we'll take a look on the interior. On the interior of El Transito, you see some of the hallmarks of what we call Mudéjar style. And if you look a few slides down, you'll see the definition of Mudéjar. But it's characterized, the style is characterized by elaborate tile and stucco work, which you can see here, the beautiful yesoria or carved stucco, as well as what we call artesanado ceilings, which are intricately joined wood uh, using supplementary pieces installed into the rafters to form decorative patterns and oftentimes will then be gilded or painted. And this uh, art form originated in Islamic Spain and in North Africa in the 13th century. But this um, mixture of elements, the artesanado ceiling, the yesoria and the decorative tile work and combining with Gothic, Romanesque, Islamic patterning uh, is the hallmarks of the style. One of the most famous examples of Mudéjar style is the Alcazar of Seville, uh, built in this form in 1358. Originally a fortress built by Muslims, it became the site of the palace for Christian King Peter of Castile. And it really is the preeminent example of Mudéjar style, which again is post Moorish um, Christian Iberia and it's the Islamic craftsmen that stayed behind that are still applying their beautiful art forms to these new structures. 
On the next slide that you see, slide 59, you'll notice uh, what we call horror vacui, which means a fear of empty spaces, which also means then that the tradition here in the Moorish style is to fill every entire space available with design and detail. So uh, take a look at both of these slides as examples of Mudejar style. In the slide above slide 60, and this one, you can see details for that Mudejar style, both what we call the azulejos or the ceramic tiles inspired by Byzantine mosaics and the zelage, which is again the mosaic tile inset into plaster base, as well as the yesoria. And then notice the uh, rib vaulting here from the Gothic tradition. So this combination of elements um, put together in very unique fashion um, and one playing off another. Notice the uh, Roman masonry at the bottom uh, below the yesoria. Uh, again, you see that, that arc of history in one uh, design combination throughout this structure. see some of the key details of a Spanish Renaissance era interior for a wealthy person. So notice the artesanado ceiling, which is the decorative beam ceiling with additional laths to create interesting intricate patterns. Uh, the use of the yesoria, the carved stucco work at the top band of the ceiling. Working our way down, we see the um, Moorish style metal light fixtures and then we look down and see the tapestry on the wall that we remember during the Renaissance, the use of tapestry to give acoustical properties to the room, give decoration, give warmth, provide insulation. Notice the paneling on the doors and the window shutters. So again, there's using shutters for um, sun protection and the use of paneling so there's less warpage in the wood with the changes in temperature. We see the sedia, the um, simple armchairs with leather, and then um, a celicurilius shape, the trestle table, and then uh, two cassone style trunks. So um, a lot of the furniture forms were coming in from the Italian Renaissance. As a matter of fact, Italian artisans were being hired to come into Spain during this time uh, to produce everything from furniture to cathedrals and paintings and so forth. So um, this room, again, is even though it's a wealthy person's room, you can see it's fairly sparsely um, furnished and they'll continue to use the D1 or built-in platforms around the perimeter of the room for seating as well and uh, just a few pieces of furniture. Not only did the grand structures such as the mosque, churches, and palaces use this combination of elements, but also residential design, you can see, incorporated the yeseria over the hooded fireplace, uh, along with what we called heraldry, which are those shield plaques, which identify a family crest. And then also the artesanado ceiling with the interlacing uh, lathes that are laid between the rafters and painted and then we have the ceramic tiles so we'll see those same kinds of details used in residential settings and we'll be talking about the furniture here coming up soon Okay, these flattened bands of pattern that you're seeing in the plaster are what's known as strap work. And this is an Islamic design motif that was inspired, it was said, by leather strapping and bindings on books. Um, and so if you can picture the leather embossing in a book cover, um, that would be where the strap work name derives. But it was a also a type of banding that will then be used in the zellige. So those white plaster bands that go between the ceramic tile pieces are also another example of strap work. 
And strap work was a detail that was quite popular in the Mannerist style. So we'll see that being incorporated in the 1500s um, in a lot of different uses coming up. Azulejos is another common substance or wall tile that you'll see used uh, throughout Spain and Portugal still today. And some say it was derived from the Arabic word that means little stone, or another meaning that means brilliant surface. So it was thought that the Moors of North Africa used that term to describe the mosaics uh, from the Roman ruins, from the Roman cities that were found there. And this term then has now been applied to this type of ceramic tile. So these were in production for centuries. And then the, after the Moors, uh, the Christians adapted it for use also. So you'll often see um, reproduction of the zealage type patterns. And even they'll be used on altar pieces. And commonly, especially in Portugal today, you'll see scenes painted uh, that are quite detailed in the azulejos. So, Still a beautiful art form um, and very much associated with Hispano-Moorish style. Okay, this is the facade of our own San Diego Museum of Art. And notice the scallop shell motif of St. James over the entrance door. This whole facade is what's called plateresco style, which means silversmith-like. So the idea is that if you can picture a silver tray uh, where the silversmith would have done casting or what we call repousse, where they pound the metal with um, a hammer to create relief patterns in the metal, uh, it's that same idea here in the structure of the facade. So you see those kind of shallow reliefs um, ornamenting the structure of the art museum here in what we call a plateresco style with that scallop shell of St. James, which will be a common motif in the furniture that we're about to see as well. You're seeing two different chairs right now from the Renaissance period in Iberia. Um, and so the chair on the left, you can see, is similar to the sedia, the chair that we studied in the Italian Renaissance. Notice the straight lines and the low stretchers connecting from leg to leg. You'll also see the use of the mortise and tenon joints, where you can see the uh, insert of the larger piece of wood inserting through the leg with that joint, or those um, squares that connect the leg to the seat. Um, this one also has leather emboss embossed leather upholstery. And the one, the chair on the right is what we call a wainscot chair. So you can see that's like they're taking a piece of paneling uh, or something very similar to wall paneling and using that for the back of the chair. And it also has a storage component in the seat. So uh, that this was a common detail in Europe uh, during this time period. The common woods used were either oak walnut or cedar, sometimes pine, and using some types of inlays as well, such as uh, pear wood or ivory. And we'll see some examples of that in subsequent slides. Notice the Savonarola chair, which is a form that came from Italy, is also using an Islamic art form called Sertosina. Uh, which is taking bits of shell or ivory or bone and, and laying it into the wood in these geometric rhythmic patterns. So it's another example of not only in the architecture where elements from different cultures combine together to create a decorative effect. In the furniture, we see that same thing where the form of the chair came from the Italian Renaissance and the decoration on the chair comes from Islam and the Muslim artists working in Spain. This piece of furniture is uniquely Spanish and it's called a Barqueño from the Vargas region of Spain. Uh, there was a town, which is a town near Toledo. Uh, there was a cabinet maker named Vargas 
who developed this style of furniture during the Mudéjar period. So this is actually two separate pieces of furniture and the, the bottom is a trestle table. So the actual barqueño is that trunk that's turned on its side and then the top leaf drops down and that is called the calatoya, uh, which becomes a writing surface and so that the trunk becomes a desk. And notice that inside of that trunk are all these compartments to store uh, papers or identity seals, money, and so forth. So this was also designed for quick transport of valuables. Um, you can see that it would be lockable and um, very sturdy so that again it's it's made to um, be movable and it became quite um, iconic to Spain from the late Middle Ages uh, and through the late 16th century onward. And uh, again, this is called a barqueño. So notice that Spanish Renaissance furniture tends to be fairly simple in design. The, the construction tends to be heavier and larger in scale than the Italian and the French furniture. Walnut will be the most frequently used wood with some bone and ivory inlay and also showing those inlays showing the Moorish influence, uh, sometimes using silver inlay as well. Tables were typically covered in cloth um, and women typically sat on a dais, if you'll recall in the, that Middle Eastern detail of a built-in platform on the perimeter of the room that was called a sufa or a diwan um, and they would typically sit in that kind of more Moorish fashion in the home. What you're seeing here is a trestle table and the slide just above was, was known again as the refractory table. So if you'll recall with the refractory table that the, the bottom has that stretcher that supports from leg to leg across the bottom. Note on the trestle table, there's two legs that some are, sometimes are cantilevered, um, kind of raked inward. And um, they typically have what's called a fiadores in Spain, which is a metal bracket support that links the legs um, and helps stabilize the table. And this is meant to be all um, removable. So the table can be taken apart and stored against the wall when not in use, which makes it a true trestle table. And here we see this little small writing chest that's on top of the trestle table, which is called a papalera. So it's also designed to be a piece of furniture that stores writing implements, paper, um, important documents, and so forth. But notice it does not have that drop front like the trunk where you'd have the drop front to create the writing surface. It's typically set on top of another writing surface, in this case, again, a trestle table. So um, sometimes it will have doors that hinge like a kitchen cabinet door, uh, and they can be larger in that respect. But this, um, because it does not have the drop front, it's called papalera instead of a barqueño. Here we have a teaster bed, which was a design started in the Middle Ages and used until about the mid 19th century. And this particular form, as you can see, is from the late Spanish Renaissance, inspired by Italian Renaissance and Baroque. Notice the barley twists or those salamic columns, the twisted columns that we saw in the baldachin of St. Peter's that Bernini designed being used as a motif here for the four post. But again, this bed would have had in the winter some kind of hangings from the post and the canopy of silk, linen, or wool. And um, the majority of people slept on what's called a plain box or stump bed. So they would have had low posts, um, but this again would have been for someone of means to have this more ornate type of bed. Here you see Spanish leather work that's embossed um, and 
French called gaffage, gaffage. Um, it's basically a technique that was came in from North Africa from the ninth century, and that's taking wet leather hides and pressing them into woodblock molds, which creates this blind printing technique. Um, and so it creates this engraving or deep dimensional effects in the leather. So if you've ever seen a Western horse saddle, that would be another example of embossed leather uh, using the Spanish tradition. The next slide you'll see is Cure de Cordo or Cordovian leather, which is taking the leather and painting it or gilding it um, along with embossing it to create these beautifully dimensional effects. So this example of filigree is a type of metalwork where um, the jeweler is taking tiny twisted threads and tiny beads and weaving them together to suggest lace. Uh, so this was a technique that was popular all the way back to the ancient Egyptians, Etruscans, the Greeks uh, in India all use filigree. But uh, while we're talking about it here is that this type of technique is then applied toward ironwork for the um, built environment. So whether it's uh, rejas de vanpanas or iron grill work across a window opening or um, iron filigree work that you'll see in some of the cathedrals separating out certain uh, sacred areas um, with an iron gate uh, or just a iron entrance gate that you might have seen. We have a lot of examples of this kind of iron filigree work here in San Diego with the uh, Moorish revival style houses that we have in many neighborhoods here. So when Columbus landed in the New World, uh, he came in contact with a tribe of people called the Taino. And these were the indigenous people of Puerto Rico, Haiti, Cuba, uh, which came from the Amazon basin. And in this culture, there were two classes. There were the nobles and the commoners. Uh, they were typically led by a male leader and a shaman who was the leader's advisor. They lived in these round houses made from wooden poles and woven palm fronds with up to 15 family members in one house. And typically the women would do the farming, the men the hunting and fishing. And um, they were a very beautiful people. Columbus said of them that they were tall, well-proportioned, noble, kind and generous, gentle and laughing. And as a matter of fact, of the group of the Taino people went back to Spain with Columbus um, and Unfortunately, the Spanish started to have this desire for gold and they call the gold lust. So they um, said that when Columbus went back on his second voyage that he must demand tribute of gold or 25 pounds of spun co cotton from each tribe member. And if they did not produce this tribute of gold or cotton, that they were to have their hands cut off. Uh, so this was the kind of barbaric behavior that the Spanish were afflicting onto the native people that they encountered. Um, also because of the fact that they had no immunities to European diseases, by 1548 the population had plummeted of the tribe to less than 500 people due to smallpox. So this um, quote unquote discovery of the New World had devastating consequences for the native populations. The Alhambra Decree, or the Edict of Expulsion, that was put forth by Ferdinand and Isabella, ordered the expulsion of Jews and Muslims from uh, both Castile and Aragorn. And it wasn't formally revoked until 1968. Um, under Islamic rule, people of Jewish faith were given special status uh, because they were called the people of the book. 
But now anyone of, not of the Catholic faith was either forced to convert or to flee the country. Um, and they were not allowed to take a lot of the property with them. So many fleeing still met with violence. Uh, so for example, unscrupulous ship captains would say, yes, we'll take you to safety. Uh, they left side of shore and the people were killed or dumped overboard and all of their belongings taken. So um, they had three months again to convert or to leave the country. And this is why a lot of people whose origins are, if you, if you look at DNA testing, um, that are from Latin America or Mexico have some Sephardic Jew um, DNA because a lot of Jewish people from Spain fled to the New World during this time because they could just uh, blend in and avoid that kind of persecution that they were experiencing in uh, Spain during this time period. This also gave rise to the Spanish Inquisition because the people that stayed um, were under suspect that they didn't actually convert to the new religion. So again, um, Ferdinand and Isabella's desire was to maintain Catholic orthodoxy and um, increase their political authority. But uh, these had some, again, devastating consequences to many, much of the population. What you're seeing here is the facade of the Toledo Cathedral, um, one of three uh, 13th century high Gothic cathedrals in Spain. And it covers what was uh, the site of a mosque that was formerly located in this place. And also a Visigothic church was on this site as well that was built in 563. But what you're seeing here, if you notice the spire, the bell tower, is the French Gothic style adapted to Spanish taste. Inside, you'll see Baroque altarpiece uh, or the transparente, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then you also see the Italian Renaissance dome. So if you'll recall Brunelleschi's design of the Duomo, uh, we see that in the mix of the on the right side of the slide. Inside the Cathedral of Toledo, there is this mixture of Gothic, Baroque, and Renaissance style, as you can see on this slide. So if you look to the left, notice the Gothic tracery, um, the spire shapes at the top with the pediment, the Gothic style carvings on the facade of this crypt. Um, if you look to the far right, you'll see the Renaissance uh, patterning with the classical a return to the Roman vocabulary of the Roman barrel vaulted arch, the Corinthian columns, the dental moldings on the entablature, um, the Roman style sarcophagus. And then if you look in the center, you can see the Baroque. So notice the use of the gold, the taller, the tall columns, the rayonet sun patterns, the larger scale, the keyed up drama of the Baroque style. So the designers of Balboa Park were influenced by the Cathedral of Toledo in their design of the California Tower and the Museum of Man. So you can see the uh, same type of Renaissance dome tower or dome structure um, over the Museum of Man and then the stepped bell tower reminiscent of different um, features in the Cathedral of Toledo. Okay, what you're seeing here is a royal site 28 miles from Madrid called El Escorial. And this was designed by an architect, Juan Batista de Toledo, who actually studied in Rome. So it's designed in Italian Renaissance style, but what the Spanish called desentormentado, meaning pared down or unornamented style. Um, king Philip II, who this was designed for, the King of Spain at the time, was a very pious person, very serious minded, and he was looking to create a monastery and a retreat. Um, and many Spanish monarchs are actually buried here as well. It's designed after the floor plan of the Temple of Solomon around two large courtyards. 
and we'll see the facade has a gray granite with a series of passageways and courtyards that in embodies simplification and construction. He wanted severity in the whole, nobility without arrogance, and majesty without ostentation. When you see some of the interior area of El Escorial, for instance, the library here, you can see further evidence of the uh, inspiration of the Italian Renaissance and the classical past. So notice the Greek key patterning in the frescoes and this um, vault of ceiling containing frescoes depicting different types of liberal arts. And uh, this housed Philip's collection, which was one of the finest in Europe, uh, partly because of all of the books that were confiscated or taken when people fled Spain, um, composed the, the Royal Library, but he had many rare copies since many of these volumes were destroyed during the Spanish Inquisition, and the, there was only f a few copies of these books left. But again, note the columns, the dental moldings, the Greek key, and the frescoes done in a very Michelangelo type Renaissance style. This is King Philip II's bedroom or royal apartment at El Escorial. And notice how simple it really is for a royal retreat. Um, the very simple teaster bed, of course, very fine tapestries and fabrics uh, around the bed. Notice that um, metal pan with the pole next to it. That's a bed warmer. They would put hot coals in that and then slide that under the sheets to warm the bed before someone got in. <clears throat> and then also, this was right above the church. Uh, Philip was quite pious and he wanted to be able to lay in bed and listen to mass. He suffered from terrible gout, which is a condition that affects your feet. And so sometimes he could not, he was bedridden, so he couldn't go to mass. So he had this place designed so that he could hear the mass from his bed. One of the common azulejos patterns, as you can see, that was used as a dado or a, a tile wainscoting in King Philip II's apartment in El Escorial is this particular pattern called Floron Arabesco. And you can see that they're acanthus leaves that look like they're swirling on a 45 degree angle. And um, this is a common pattern that's still used in tile today. I uh, see this kind of swirling leaf pattern in the Talavera tiles of Mexico. So when we see structures here in San Diego, like this building from the Univers University of San Diego, uh, we see those examples of desentormentado style, which were influenced by Vitruvius's principles, Vitruvian principles from uh, Rome moving forward through the Italian Renaissance, where again, some of these Spanish architects studied in Rome and brought the knowledge of these classical designs back to Spain. And these influences uh, interpreted again through this scarce decoration and precisely cut granite with these kind of um, classical details that are completely pared down will influence Spanish architecture for a century and will also influence what we call Spanish Revival style uh, here in other areas of the world. What you're seeing here is an altarpiece, the Transparente or El Transparente, uh, which is a Baroque altarpiece in the Cathedral of Toledo. And the name refers to this unique uh, use of the oculus or that illumination coming from the, the, real, the roof and bringing that light down into the cathedral. Notice he's um, also using angel faces looking down from heaven into the cathedral. So it's a, what's called churigoresco style, which is noted for its very fanciful, very ornate type of uh, decoration and something that's 
associated with Spanish Baroque. Um, again, very over the top. And not only was the skylight cut into the top of the thick back wall of the cathedral, it was, um, again, using a light source to illuminate the altar. And it was thought that it was Tomé was perhaps influenced or inspired by Bernini and his use of those oculuses and hidden light sources in St. Peter's Basilica. So if you can remember the ecstasy of St. Teresa and the altar pieces uh, in St. Peter's with those light sources. Tomé worked on this with his sons as a way to visually connect um, light with sculpture. And these include, you know, um, sculptures of angels, saints, prophets, and so forth. Um, also flowing cloth that we said is very um, aligned with Baroque style and these kinds of biblical figures that seem to tumble from heaven down into the cathedral. So again, it's this very fantastical style that uh, is associated with Spanish Baroque. This altarpiece is a mixture of stucco, painting, bronze, and marble. And um, it's in that Chigoresco style is noted for the fact that it obscures the lines of the architecture. So notice how there's so much ornamentation that, for example, if you look at the columns, they're partially clad in angel figures. Um, so it's like taking again a, a wedding cake or a birthday cake and coating, coating it with so much layers of frosting that you no longer see the shape of the cake. Um, and that is very common to the Spanish Baroque style. And um, recall this was the church's effort to ramp up the drama and ramp up the religious fervor for the Catholic faith to bring people back in alignment with church teaching. So uh, the desire to do that is reflected in this very highly dramatic uh, type of design called Churigoresco style. So when you're looking at Balboa Park and the facades there, notice they're using the Spanish Baroque style, uh, the Churigoresco style. Um, if you notice the top roof lines of the buildings with their, that highly ornamented decoration that's obscuring the lines of the architecture. If you look down underneath the red tile roof and see the arcade of arches, notice they're Florentine arches. So um, the designers for Balboa Park for the 1915 Panama Exposition were very greatly influenced by uh, Spanish style, of course, in designing these buildings in Balboa Park. So hopefully now when you go to the park, you'll be able to appreciate the facades and maybe uh, with a deeper level of knowledge. Another example of Spanish Baroque style influencing uh, design in this area are the California missions. So um, what happened, the founders of the missions were bringing that Spanish Baroque style over, but of course using um, the type of materials and craftsmanship that they had available. But we'll still see those same design motifs. So notice the rayonet sun over the altarpiece, um, the artesanado type ceiling, the frescoes, the classical columns, and again, some of that ornamentation then reflecting those different time periods in Spanish design. And so uh, hopefully when you look around our neighborhoods and different structures here, you'll see lots of uh, examples of Spanish revival style and be able to now identify some of the details associated with it. The Baroque style also included the furniture and notice the carotid supports on the legs. Notice the uh, scrolling legs too, having that S turn, and that C scroll in the shape of the leg. And remember that the Baroque style was influenced by the idea of movement, trying to get your eye to move around the piece. So we also have um, the use of the gold and the putti or the little angelic figures, which represents uh, the knowledge of God. And that had been a symbol that was used since the Italian Renaissance to represent that. And so we still have the functional papillera, which is a cabinet to store paperwork and valuables and writing implements. Uh, but again, done in this very ornate 
Baroque style. The Spanish Baroque and the Italian Baroque <clears throat> tend to be uh, quite whimsical and very heavy handed. And um, our next lecture is going to be about French furniture. We'll also see, we'll go much more deep into Baroque style then and some of the essential components that make it Baroque style. But uh, just note the kind of heavy uh, amount of ornamentation on these next few pieces of furniture. We will now be discussing the second half of the lecture, which is about the indigenous cultures of North and South America and Central America. And of course, these cultures are quite ancient and very complex and uh, varied with many different cultural traditions. But we're just hitting a few of the uh, tribes and cultures that have effects on the built environment and architecture and things that um, are notable that have been carried forward throughout time. What you're seeing here is a cliff dwelling from the Anasazi um, civilization, the ancient ones. And these cliff houses were amazing places. They were located up high on the rock cliffs um, so that they were not easily attacked by enemies. And people would go up and down ropes or ladders to work in gardens on top of the mesa or down in the valley below. Um, these constructions were called pueblos and they were made um, into multi-roomed dwellings, um, sometimes up to 800 rooms, almost like an apartment house. And they were made from adobe, again, mixing mud and straw and baking these bricks in the sun, creating load bearing construction and some use of stone as well. Uh, the roofs would have layers of logs laid across to create that roof structure and they would often uh, be accessible from wooden ladders that would go down into you know up to the next level the round dwellings that you see or the round pits that you see in the foreground are the kivas which are ceremonial um, pits and these would also have been accessible from a ladder where you'd climb down into that um, structure which we'll be talking about next but then Anasazi lived in the um, what is now the American Southwest from about 1500 BC to 1500 AD. And um, the, their descendants are now the tribes that are uh, the Hopi, Zuni, and Pueblo Native American tribes. A typical kiva would have been used by the men for ceremony. And the walls would have been painted with murals uh, with sacred symbols. The layout you can see here, there's that, that built-in bench, but there's the sipapu, which is a mystic hole, but it's usually two to three inches in diameter in the floor, where they believe the spirit of the ancestors would emerge for their ceremony. And again, you would enter this by via ladder uh, from, the, from a hole in the roof. So the, the community would usually have a mon kiva, which was a larger kiva, a main kiva that was used for um, community ceremony. The first Anasazi were called basket makers. Uh, they made these strong and beautiful baskets that you can see in these slides, primarily from the fibers of a yucca plant or from, sometimes from wet willow uh, that had been, that bends easily. They carried food and water in these baskets, and they even put hot stones in the basket to cook food. And note the patterning on the basket, which we've seen in other cultures. And these are some of the patterns that, uh, again, we have seen repeated throughout history and, and human development all over the world. So kind of a Greek key style um, patterning on that one basket in a, a Egyptian type chevron that we've seen and the other basket. But again, these would have been used for carrying food and water and preparing food as well. These are shell gorgets, which were part of the Mississippian 
Mississippian culture, which thrived along the banks of the Mississippi River from 800 to 1600 AD. And that mound that you saw, that man-made mass, uh, was part of the tradition of that, that, that culture. They were called mound builders. So they would create settlements um, that would be elevated on those mounds. And they were also agricultural based. So they would grow what they call the three sisters, which is corn, beans, and squash. Um, they also were working with some metal such as copper and um, other kinds of art forms such as these gorgets, which is basically a necklace that's worn tight against the throat. And you can see on the necklace, um, these, the carving in the bone in the shell, again, some of the uh, motifs that we've seen in other cultures. So uh, again, just showing a, the connection between widely disparate cultures throughout the world using the same types of patterning. These uh, trade routes also include, we think, a connection with um, South America or Central America, at least, because they were having things like macaw feathers found in these ruins. And um, of course, macaws don't live in North America naturally. So this gives us evidence that there was trade going on with um, in large distances. What you're seeing here are plank houses from tribes of the Pacific Northwest. So now we're jumping up to the Pacific Northwest part of North America. And some of these plank houses could be built up to 12 thousand square feet. So they were the type of structure that was used in this area for about 2,500 years from about 3000 BC on, um, typically made from red cedar planks. And you can see the totem in front, which was a symbol of the tree of life. And um, these were a communal structure. So they were very important to winter ceremonies. Um, unfortunately, Communal living was outlawed in the 1860s, so they weren't able to continue to use these large structures. But if you'll note, note the one on the bottom right corner, this was a typical strategy that the Salish people used in that they would have um, those vertical poles that would be supports for these redwood planks and these cedar planks that they would mill down to fit horizontally into those poles. This enabled them to move their house easily. So they would keep the vertical poles in place, slide the boards out and relocate to a different community, for example, in the summer when they were um, gathering other types of food sources. And then in the winter, they could take those planks out of the summer dwelling and then reconstruct uh, the winter dwelling by sliding them back into the existing vertical pole. So it was quite ingenious and um, a typical type of living situation for the hunter-gatherers of the Pacific Northwest. Well, these, these vertical um, carvings that you're seeing here from the Salish people and the Haida people of uh, the Pacific Northwest uh, are carvings using cedar logs, and they would use stone, which is called a maul, uh, or an adz, to chisel away these kinds of carvings that were considered what they call a house pole. So you can see on that one slide, you actually enter through the totem to get into inside the dwelling. They were um, a world tree also. So the upper part would represent the sky world. So you can notice on that one, you, there's looks like an owl totem at the top of that. <clears throat> the trunk of the tree would be this world and the roots are considered the underworld. So they would be carved to show sacred beings or cult culturally important animals, historical events or people that were used for protection for the dwelling and for the tribe. And then you can see that communal living situation with those built-in benches and um, the gathering that would occur during the winter months, which were important um, times to connect and have ceremony for these tribes. The Mesoamerican cultures of Mexico and Central America, um, some of which you see listed on the slide here, had a shared concept that the universe was uh, two four-sided pyramids joined at their bases with the earth in between them. And this was part of their belief that there was an upper world, which was heaven or the cosmic mountain. And this was the dwelling of the feathered creatures um, and the male aspects. It was also associated with light and warmth. And then there was the lower world, which was the earth. And 
the snake was the representation of this. And this was also the female energy of the planet um, and also associated with damp and dark. So it was that similar to we saw in China with the yin and yang concept with the two different um, aspects balancing the whole, we will see symbolism in these cultures of that coming together of heaven and earth. And we've seen that in many of the cultures we study is actually, so these will be no exception. The Olmecs were the earliest known major civilization in Mesoamerica. And they, the area where they lived was South Central Mexico, which is now the present day states of Veracruz and Tabasco. Um, and these, this culture flourished uh, during the Mesoamerican formative period. So again, you can see on the slide about 1500 BC to 400 BC. Uh, they were the first dominant civilization and they laid the foundation for many of the civilizations that we'll study following these. So among the first, um, they were the first to practice that Mesoamerican ball game um, and that we'll talk more about in a little bit. And they were also very fine craftspeople. So you can see this beautiful jade carved mask that was something they were known for as their jade uh, resource that they used for trade. And also they were known for these colossal carved heads carved from basalt. Um, and it was def the Olmec civilization was first defined through these artifacts. And um, again, they're some of the most striking of the artifacts from the Mesoamerican tribes. What you're seeing here to the right is a settlement called La Venta which became the most prominent Olmec center lasting from about 900 BCE till its abandonment around 400 BCE. Um, the La Venta sustained uh, many of the Olmec cultural traditions and this great pyramid was the largest Mesoamerican structure of its time, which, rose, which is, rises about 112 feet high above this naturally flat landscape. And buried within it lay all different types of mosaic pavements, 48 separate deposits of polished jade, pottery figurines, and um, different types of stone mirrors. So again, uh, just shows the wealth of the area. Also shows the trade routes that were going on. They were thought to be have extensive trade routes going from Guatemala um, up through Mes all of Mesoamerica. What you see on the left are these basalt heads that are thought to be Olmec leaders. So the heads are showing individuals. There's been 17 of these found, anywhere from 10 feet to 15 feet high each, and each weighing up to eight tons. So again, each have unique facial features with this type of ball player's helmet. Um, there is a certain ball game that we'll talk about in a little bit that was a ceremonial game. And it was thought that these were carved from a single basalt stone and then transported by raft using log rollers uh, to locate into different uh, settlements for these various rulers. Okay, our next culture that we're going to discuss are the Aztecs, who probably originated as a nomadic tribe in northern Mexico and arrived in this area, which is now modern day Mexico City and around the 13th century. Uh, they created a magnificent capital city, Tenochtitlan, and they became the dominant force in central Mexico, developing a very intricate social, political, and religious, and commercial networks um, through many different city-states, and were the dominant power until Cortes, the Spanish conquistador, came and overthrew their empire by force in ca and captured Tenochtitlan in 1521. During the Aztecs nomadic years, they were given a prophecy that they should create their settlement in a location where they see an eagle clutching a snake landing on a cactus. And this happened along the shores of Lake Tecoco, uh, which is now again, modern day Mexico City. So this is why they decided to create their power base in that location. It's also why you see that um, symbol on the Mexican flag. The Aztecs were pyramid builders, and these pyramids would be found in the town center um, and include a temple on top uh, around in front of a public plaza. And so these two, two stone staircases would be facing the setting sun. And they were carved from this type of soft stone, um, which is kind of a reddish volcanic stone 
that uh, you can see was carved into these very intricate shapes. And one of the iconic shapes is the feathered serpent. So we'll see these serpent statues at the temple stairs at this pyramid again. And um, these typically had pine and oak used for the beams and doors along with this uh, volcanic stone structure. Okay, so this is an artistic rendition of what Tenochtitlan would have looked like um, with the two sacred temples. One with the blue steps is to honor the god of rain, and with the red, the god of war. And we see the blue would be um, dedicated during the summer solstice, which is the wet season, and the red, the winter solstice, which is the dry season. And there were all kinds of canals built um, all, along this lake, and there were floating gardens. Uh, there were a sacred precinct with 78 structures, ball courts, and um, different great temples. And also the palace of Montezuma II, who was the ruler of the Aztecs um, toward the end of the empire. And this palace had 100 rooms, each with their own bath. Uh, two houses were zoos, one for birds of prey, other for other types of birds, reptiles and mammals. Uh, he had a large botanical garden and even an aquarium with tin ponds from with different types of fish and even saltwater ponds with aquatic birds and so forth. So uh, very rich and uh, incredible building. So as you can see, when the soldiers of Cortez saw this area, they thought it seemed as a dream. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. What you're seeing here is the double-headed serpent. Uh, it's made of mosaic of small pieces of turquoise and um, oyster shell with also some conch shell, and it's on a cedar wood base. And so it was thought that this was given by Montezuma to Cortez in 1519. There's 2,000 small pieces on these curves, and it's also showing their trade routes with the Anasazi people of the Four Corners area because this is where the turquoise came from. And again, it's the snake earth. The turquoise is representing the sky and the snake is representing the earth. So just like the feathered serpent, this symbol of the coming together of both heaven, which is represented by the feathers. And in this case of this particular artifact, the turquoise sky and the serpent, which is representing earth. So again, an important um, symbol for Mesoamerican culture that we'll see uh, in many forms. Here we're seeing the magnificent Pyramid of the Sun, and this is the third largest pyramid in the world. Um, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And if you could picture this, that it was originally plastered and painted white with colorful murals, and it's built over a man-made tunnel leading into a, a cave, which we're not sure if it was a burial site or something below the earth. Another example, again, of the earth and the sky connecting. So there were two phases of construction here before the Aztecs. Um, it was thought it was constructed about 200 AD and abandoned in 750 AD. So this is um, going back to the earlier culture of Teotihuacan culture, um, which were in the area just north of Mexico City prior to the Aztecs arriving in this area. This is the beautiful and magnificent Pyramid of the Sun. In this slide, you're seeing on the left a ball court. And there is a sacred ball game called Ulama or Pakatak. The Mayans called it Pakatak. <laughs> and this game symbolized human struggle. So there were usually two opposing teams of seven with a rubber ball. And the teams were only allowed to use their hips, knees, shoulders, or head, no hands or feet to hit the ball um, from member to member. And they try to score the ball through a vertical hoop. And the winning team captain was given a quick death, uh, which meant that they were going heading to paradise. So it was a ritual ball game that uh, had high stakes. And uh, you can see the uh, ball court here on the left. And now we get to the incredibly complex and rich culture of the Maya. And again, each of these cultures, you could study a lifetime or plus. So we're just very much skimming the surface, and I apologize for that. But um, the part of the Mayan culture, which had the largest 
contribution to the built environment uh, was around 750 BC to 500 BC, where they started to bring in monumental architecture with large temples, elaborate stucco facades, hieroglyphic writing, and again, a very complex um, society of these city-states. And they believed that life was cyclical, that nothing born ever died. Uh, they were brilliant architects, astronomers, and mathematicians, and many of their structures were built around to commemorate a 20-year period of time called a cartoon. Uh, they also built pyramids around towns and plazas, and the temples and the temples were typically on top of the pyramids, which were uh, areas used for offerings to the gods, as well as tombs for rulers, and also uh, areas for sacrificial victims. And uh, these pyramids were considered sacred mountains. Here we see the El Castillo, Castillo, which is the largest pyramid at Chichen Itza, which is a temple um, in the Yucatan area of Mexico. And it was dedicated to Kukulkan, which was their feathered serpent deity. So it's a stepped pyramid about 98 feet tall, made out of limestone, uh, with stairs on all four sides. And it's aligned so that in the uh, spring and fall equinox, it appears as if Kukulkan, the feathered serpent, is climbing down the pyramid. So on the next slide, you can see the late afternoon sun um, and the shadowing of the stairs creating, or the steps on the pyramid, creating this illusion of the serpent um, coming down the side of the, the pyramid and accumulating in a carved head of the serpent at the bottom. So check that out on the next slide. So what you're seeing here is what's called a cenote, and this is a sacred cenote for Chichen Itza. Uh, that name Chichen Itza means the mouth of the well of the Itza, which is the cenote. Um, and this particular cenote was a place where they would make sacrifice. So thousands of sacrificial artifacts um, are found in this well or this spring, um, everything from jade, gold, pottery, a volcanic glass called obsidian, human sacrifice, human skeletons have been found in here, weapons, copper, textiles, all his offerings at this cenote, which is a natural spring. So when we're looking at other Mayan structures, um, they had symbolic numbers being used to represent different things. So, for example, 13, the number 13 represented heaven, 9, the underworld, and 7, the earth. Uh, we'll see that they're, they're used, the use of corbeling, meaning the stone tilting inward to create these triangular shapes and the passageways. Uh, they were using post and lintel construction with wood and, uh, again, using different types of stone to create everything from this astro astronomy tower and also things like lavatories and steam rooms. And um, some of these settlements were, you know, over a thousand years old that would include things like palaces, temples, shrines and altars, uh, different roadways. And as a matter of fact, there's still more Mayan temples and Mayan settlements being found all the time. Uh, this whole area is densely wooded at trop with tropical hardwoods of mahogany and cedar and it's um, very, very dense jungles. So they're starting to realize there's far, far more Mayan um, temples than and Mayan ruins than we ever thought before. Uh, again, these key Mayan attributes are they lived in independent city-states uh, making these structures from limestone, sandstone, and wood. Um, using even things like burnt lime cement to create stucco patterns and using uh, murals on the inside with very brilliant colors such as bright red, yellow, and blue. So the general populace lived in wattle and daub mud huts, um, but these large important city centers typically had again um, an alignment with the heavenly bodies such as the solstices uh, and the equinoxes and um, astronomical alignments. <clears throat> so 
The Mayans were adept carvers, so you see stone carving here out of limestone, which they would use to decorate their architecture, altars and thrones and temples. And then on the right slide, you see a stucco molding. So they would actually model um, both the architecture and different decorative artifacts. And this is a bust of a ruler uh, modeled from stucco. And they would also carve elaborately in wood for their lintels above their doorways. If you look at this stone carving from the Mayan temples uh, and this beautiful intricate patterning, you can see the inspiration uh, for Frank Lloyd Wright's textile block phase of architecture, uh, which he called his Mayan revival style. Frank Lloyd Wright, the American architect, was greatly influenced by Mayan architecture because he liked how it looked like the uh, ruins were just dissolving back into their landscape. So it looked like they arose, emerged naturally from the landscape and now are eroding back into the landscape, which he sought for his architecture to look like as well. So the next few blocks, you, the next few slides, you can see the use of those textile blocks from Frank Lloyd Wright emulating Mayan uh, decorative arts and architecture. The last culture we're going to touch on is the Incan Empire, uh, which is the largest pre-Columbian empire in America. And uh, the administrative and political military center of this empire was located in the city of Cusco. Uh, the Incan civilization arose from the Peruvian highlands sometime in the 13th century. And it was the last stronghold was conquered by the Spanish in 1572. So, um, what you're seeing here is some of the gold from that empire. It was very wealthy in gold and um, these different kinds of uh, artifacts that you're seeing were representative of their sun god Inti. So they were um, worshiping the gold as the sweat of the sun. And so you'll see these gold clad uh, temples and um, this god Inti again was one of their main gods. And it was also thought that the emperor descended from this sun god. So uh, the word Inca actually means ruler. And um, again, these gold adornments were meant to uh, embody in the ruler with that power of the sun. So what you're seeing here are remnants of the temple of the sun from the capital of Cusco. It was the most sacred site in the Incan Empire. Um, this Temple of the Sun was said to be dedicated to the sun god Inti and also to the moon goddess. And there was enormous amounts of gold to decorate the temple, but you can see the structure of the temple was made from what we call ashlar stone, which is the use of natural stone, which is um, smoothed down and formed into these very specific shapes. And notice the walls um, leaning in and the windows being trapezoidal shaped. So again, these stones were smoothed to uh, fit without the use of mortar and uh, actually be almost interlocking blocks. And that way they withstood 500 years of time intact. Uh, the gold unfortunately has not. The, Spaniard, the Spaniards stripped the temple of all the gold and took it back to Spain. We'll end our discussion of the Incans with a view of Machu Picchu, which is located about 50 miles northwest of Cusco. And it was a emperor's estate built between 1450 to 1470 AD, uh, supporting about 750 residents, uh, including people who were farming at these different terraces. They had water from a spring channeled into different stone lined canals, which fed 16 different ritual fountains. And they were growing everything from peanuts, um, cocoa, chili peppers, and beans, corn, potatoes, and 80 different varieties of orchids, as a matter of fact. So this was also 
built with a viewing platform for ceremonies and processionals. Um, there was a monumental gateway and these stone houses that were built again into the hillside to provide cool and shade uh, with gravel and drainage for the, uh, the terraces. And these stone homes were again built with that ashlar technique where they're so finely fitted together that you could stick a knife in the between the stones um, without mortar and um, again many of them were situated the house of the wise person were situated with walls um, and windows that were had celestial alignment for the winter solstice and um, with alignment for certain constellations like the pleiades so this is the magnificent Machu Picchu um, and I hope you enjoyed this very brief tour of some of the uh, examples of the built environment from Mesoamerica. Thank you.